All right, welcome back to the Dungeon of Doom. I am Kai Mikey, Lions beat reporter for M Live, joined one last time <laughs> by Ben Raven, and for the first time, uh, Corey Woods. Um, <laughs> something a little bit different coming at you this week. Um, this is my last, my last week, my second to last day at M Live after 17 years and 12 years on the Lions beat. So this will be my last Dungeon of Doom. Um, it's been a ride. I mean, we gave birth to this thing, I think, three years ago now, two years ago. And to see the growth and, and people really enjoy it. Obviously, I think we started a podcast at exactly the right time because the Lions God, went yeah. to, the, <laughs> to the heights last year. And it's been a, a real treat to um, interact in this way. Yeah, wasn't our first podcast like they were one in six? And it was right after Sheila yeah. came out and talked to us. And then all of a sudden, the Lions have been the hottest team in the league since then. Corey's been there for a lot of it, too. So yeah. A lot of you already know who Corey is. He's going to be stepping into that chair with me. Uh, we're, we're looking forward to it. But, yeah, it's been a heck of a ride, man. Uh, I think our, like, starting punchline was six decades of uninterrupted losing. And ever since we've launched this podcast, it's been a brand new franchise. <laughs> so you're welcome is what yeah, we're saying. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> no, man, I, like, you know, I started on this beat in 2013. Um, that was Jim Schwartz's final year. I, I covered – Jim Caldwell, I covered every day of the Matt Patricia <laughs> regime. <laughs> Sorry. Every day of the Daryl Bevel regime. Uh, I, did, I I have seen some stuff over the years covering the Detroit Lions, as everyone out there has um, seen rooting for this team. And to see their ascent in the last couple of years um, has been a real treat, just from like a beat writer perspective. To, I mean, this is an eternal laughing stock. Yeah. This is the Chicago Cubs of the NFL, <laughs> but sadder in some ways, I feel like. I mean, just a... a, a a joke, really. I mean, they were the laughing stock. They were the punching line of the NFL. And now they are the envy of the NFL, or certainly one of them. And um, to see that turnaround and to be able to be around here for it and to be able to even see some of the, the first seeds of it coming to fruition. Uh, when when Sheila took over, yeah. we talked about it on the pod and we got angry emails about, oh, that's just another <laughs> Ford, uh, Ford ownership, sell the team. Like how many emails we got like that? Um, but you could see that she was doing things differently. And I mean, we didn't know at the time that Dan Campbell and Brad Holmes were going to be these guys, but you saw that it could work, that, that decisions were, were being made for different reasons. And yeah, to, to, to now see it come together, to see that ethos, that culture drip all the way down to the, the roster, all the way down to the 53rd guy, all the way out of the practice squad. And, um, and now came, teams around the NFL are trying to copy it. It's been yeah. a real pleasure. God, I bet, man. Thinking of when you started yeah. and the stuff you went through and the Matt Patricia tenure alone. I started in the middle of the Matt Patricia tenure. <laughs> so <laughs> you have you have Mike yeah, Mike yeah, Mike you didn't see the 0 16 season, but you might have seen worse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we we do have a mailbag coming up. That's kind of what we do on Thursdays. I think a lot of this will center on me, which is a little uncomfortable for me. <laughs> Um, but I can just open it up real fast because there are some questions about what's going on and I can answer them on my way out the door. <laughs> uh, but Keith K asks, uh, where's Kyle going? Being from Kent City, my hometown, um, a little dot on the map. Um, Keith thinks he deserves to know. Um, happy to tell you, Keith. Um, shout out Kent City. Um, I went there, by the way, um, yeah. during the bye week. First time back there in 10 years. Still got the one stop site. The <laughs> one stop late. Um, but I'm going to Berlin, Germany. There, there's no other job. Um, you know, I think that's what people typically expect when someone leaves uh, a gig, especially a good gig in this business. But um, you know, I've done this job for a long time. And I think in my mind, maybe too long for me personally. And I think it's strange for a lot of people that, like, the number one question I've gotten this week as this news has become public is, really <laughs> right now like we covered this this right, dog bleep right, right. team for so long and now they're seven and one they've won six straight um they just just um eviscerated the packers for the third straight year in green bay um and you're gonna walk away <laughs> um but you know it's like my life um like this job has been such a joy it's been the greatest joy of my adult life um being able to do this and to interact with fans and to travel the country and to, to I mean, get paid to write. I mean, mm -hmm. really, that's what I wanted to do when I got into this business at 19 years old. Um, but like my life is more than that. And um, I, 2023 was a hard year for me personally. I had a couple of things going on. At the same time, the Lions were like doing this historic thing and becoming a viral sensation and uh, making history. And I can't tell you guys how much, how difficult, how much it 
it took out of me to uh, handle my personal life and to connect with those emotional moments on Sundays for the Lions, um, going on low sleep sometimes and, and things like that, just um, handling some personal stuff. And so, um, yeah, it was a tough year for me. And um, I'm very happy to say things are much, much better. Um, I went to Europe this summer. I've, I've been going to Berlin for years. I studied there as an exchange student when I was a kid um, in, in college. Uh, I have a, one of my best friends there. He was an exchange student with my family yeah. um, when I was in high school. <laughs> like, he's like my best friend. He's like my brother from another mother, you know? Um, and um, I went back there this summer and I, I fell in love with my partner. Yeah. And it's been a, a great year for me and healing and, and all these things. And now I just, I felt this overwhelming sensation that, you know, now was the time for me to leave and to go be with my people, to go be with my girl, to go be with uh, my best friend um, who happens to have a spare friend I'm ready to go in Berlin. <laughs> and I, I love that place. And I've thought about moving there for years, uh, for many years. And the only reason I didn't do this, I was just telling John Heine this actually, our top guy at MLive, um, we were having a chat and yeah, like I, I would have left years ago if my life here wasn't so damn good. Yes. You know, yeah. like this job, as you guys know, it's hard. It's super hard, but it's so rewarding and so much fun mm -hmm. and you get so much out of it and getting paid to write. I mean, for guys like us, that's, that's the dream. Yeah. And there's a lot of free food too. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and so like it, it kept me planted and yeah. I'm, I'm thankful for that. But, um, now I just, I have a life in Berlin and I've thought about it. I'm bottom line. I'm, I'm more than just football and there's more to life than just that for me. And I, I'm ready to go live a new adventure. Yeah, man. And I, what I've been telling people is like, there's not a lot of people in this industry that get to go out the way you're going and you've earned it. And it's just like, you're making a choice for yourself and this job's awesome. We love this job. We do it, but it's a freaking grind, especially when yeah. you're in your role. I've gotten the taste of the travel grind the last two years <laughs> with this team meeting something. And like those Mondays after primetime games, I, I feel like I'm still in my hotel room in green Bay mentally right now. Like it, doing that for as long as you did it. Cause you were on the Michigan beat before you did the yeah. Lions beat going yeah. to Champaign, Illinois, going to yeah. West Lafayette and stuff like that. Like that's, that ages you. It, it takes a lot out of you. It, it, it's a grind, man. So it's just, and you're leaving in the best possible way. You're doing what you want to do to be with your people, to live your life. You put your life on hold for so long, the Thanksgivings, the holidays, the weekends. I mean, we're gone like 40 weeks of the year. It feels like with this job sometimes and unable to move around. So it's just yeah. happy for you, man. I Thanks, mean, man. it sucks to lose you, but it's like happy for you because you're doing what you need to do. Um, the next question comes from Eric in Kalamazoo. He asks for my favorite and least favorite moments um, <laughs> as a Lions beat writer. I guess I was going to start with the, the favorites, but I guess I'll start with the least favorites. Just to, just to piggyback on the conversation you opened up, Ben, which is the difficulties of doing this job. Um, you know, you mentioned Thanksgiving. I, I haven't been with my family on Thanksgiving because I was on the Michigan beat before that. Now it's always Ohio State week. So I've been with my family on Thanksgiving since 2010. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, granted, I'm moving to 3,000 miles away from my family now. <laughs> but, but like I can be with my loved ones and have normal holidays yeah. and, and yeah. things like that. And um, I looked at my Marriott Lifetime Nights the other day um, <laughs> as I'm putting a bow on my career and we're kind of talking about stuff in the press room. Uh, 784. <laughs> and granted, some of that is personal travel, but most 99% of it uh, is not. And so that's, that's two years of my life <laughs> that I've spent in hotel rooms. And I think people think when they think about traveling, um, with this job, they think it's, it's sexy, that it's, that it's hot, that it, it, it's fun. <laughs> and you know what? It was for me for a long time. Not that every trip is uh, New York, but, mm -hmm. but I've got, I've lit, I filed by, bylines from the West coast to the East coast, to almost everywhere in between probably 25 states like getting to see so much of this country mm -hmm. um and on someone else's dime <laughs> thank you i'm live um is a is a joy yeah. it's a, a an experience that um it's one of my favorite experiences about being on this beat going back to the question is, is being able to, I, I love to travel yep. um and being able to see this country um and to, to, to cover this team while doing it has been a a thrill, you know, going to London a couple of times um, yeah. was a thrill going to Malta after uh, <laughs> like, so I went to London and back then, like if you were in London playing, you get, you got the bye week the following week automatically. I don't remember. I don't know if it's still that way or not, but um, and so it got like, we're busy with this job and it got to be like two weeks before that London game. I'm like, oh crap. Like I haven't like booked my 
travel for the that week out the week after the, the London game. So basically, I just looked at the flights. I found the cheapest thing to a warm place, yeah. and it was this island in the Mediterranean <laughs> called Malta. <laughs> That's awesome. Beautiful place. Very random. Uh, I know. And I was kicking it on a beach. Um, my cell phone didn't work there because it's Malta. And I remember going back onto the grid and my phone just going. <laughs> and that's because Tom Lewand and Martin Mayhew had been fired. <laughs> or Justin Rogers, who's my beat partner at that time, um, had to handle that by himself because I was just uh, off in no man's land. So, you know, just stories like that. Like, I, I remember, like, one of my favorites was Lions Patriots in 2014. And the mm-hmm. Lions got just destroyed in that game it was good lion scene terrible game um but the night before that game like i'd gone out with a friend um and we're having dinner we're having oysters someplace in boston and i remember her saying um you know, she worked for the red sox yeah and she's like have you ever been to fenway park and i'm like no i haven't and she was like do you want to go see fenway park i remember saying i remember saying like yeah right like you got the keys to fenway park and she's like yeah i do <laughs> So we go to Fenway Park. There's nobody there. Like it's the middle. It's the middle of the night at this point. She like goes to the like the electric box or whatever. Turns on the lights to Fenway Park. We're walking around. We spent some time in the Green Monster in the middle of the night. <laughs> Children dug out. Sat on the, the uh, pitcher's mound. I mean, just I mean, we spent like hours there. You know, um, I remember like this is back when we were really trying to save some money. And Justin Rogers, who was my beat partner at the time, him and I were sharing a hotel room. <laughs> and I remember getting back like in the morning like an hour before we had to like leave for the game it's like dude i was like worried about you <laughs> and i basically spent an all-nighter um i was you know it's not at my best that day. <laughs> but then again now that we're the lions um, so just i mean just really wonderful stories like that i'm really yeah. thankful to have been able to, to travel despite how difficult it was um, sometimes to be away so far uh, the free food will be something I miss a lot. You know, um, <laughs> there's an art to the press box buffet, and of all of all my honors uh, in this profession, I'm very like the mastering the dark arts. The press box buffet plate um, is one of my <laughs> my favorite memories, and I I'm glad to show you my Padawan yes. the way on that. <laughs> I was gonna say in Heiner's column this morning, the last line is it is about yeah. the halftime plate of food. <laughs> when you, you got the buffet line, you everybody eats at like 11:30 in the morning. Kyle taught me from the beginning. No matter if you're hungry, go back, make another plate of food. It disappears. Eat that throughout the game and at halftime. So yeah. that is why I'm this sized. But <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no, man. It's, yeah. it's a legacy I can be proud of. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, <laughs> and then the football side. I do want to hit on that because it's, you know, like you can't do this job without having some kind of love for what you're doing or covering or the, the people around this building. Um, and being able to develop those relationships and understand what's happening and then try to relate, relate that, that, that to the fans. You'll be terrible at, at this job and you'll burn out uh, and be a miserable per- human being if you don't have some kind of love for the work itself yes. on the field. And I had a love for that. Um, and um, being able to, again, chronicle the rise of the, tr- of the Detroit Lions, this this laughing stock. I mean, they were a punchline. I remember... Mm-hmm. Thanksgiving 2020, when they, uh, our friend Mike Mulholland took a, a photo of, of Sheila uh, Sheila Hamp in the in the suite with her hands <laughs> over her face. I mean, there was no better photo at that time to, to be the, um, the avatar of what the Lions were and had been for forever. And to be able to see that team in just four years become the powerhouse they are now, and not just winning games, but just smacking folks, yeah. and not just smacking folks, but like... Be, like becoming a model organization. Like when teams hire now, they want to hire up either Ben Johnson or Abe yeah. or Ben Johnson, someone like that, you know, they want to hire a Dan Campbell or someone like Dan Campbell. Um, and so I don't know that it, it, it's cool to see them rise from the ashes and to be able to be around for. And like my last game that I ever covered Lambeau field lions Packers, like I filed my, um, my quick story out of the game. Um, I leave the press box, go down the elevator, and then I have to run around the the mezzanine to get down to the, um, the locker room, to the locker room. And the fans are chanting at Lambeau Field and those hollowed halls, Jared, Goff, Jared, and, like, it's just wild to see like this, like he got benched in year one here, yeah. like fans are booing him for throwing away fourth down passes. And now, I mean, heck, like yesterday, the day before, there's a video going around. I think, Corey, you posted it of um a red wings game where they're chanting jared goff's name in freaking chicago (laughs) it's unbelievable Uh, (laughs) and to be able to tell the stories of this team and their rise it's been a, a real professional pleasure
no, man, and you've been a great soundtrack to it, too. I know a lot of the focus has been like, how are you going to leave before they win a Super Bowl? You've already seen an unimaginable rise, like you said, just Sheila taking over, like, oh, it's just another Ford, it's just another Ford Ford, but, like, she literally, I don't know, man, you you got to see it all. Like, I know people are focusing on the end of the line and stuff like that, but, like, going out the way you did, three straight at Lambeau. Imagine that, telling yourself that in 2013, that the Lions would win three straight at Lambeau. Yeah, I started, I began my career covering the 23rd <laughs> and 24th and 25th, like, straight <laughs> losses in Wisconsin. That's a record in any sport, like, for a single rivalry. Um you know, it, it, I mean, we all know it. Like anyone of a certain age knows about that 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 record because you heard about it every single year the Lions went to Wisconsin, and no matter how good or bad they were, they fell on their face. Yeah. And now they just go out there and take care of business, even a rainstorm without you know, Hutchinson and Jamison Williams and all that. Like they go out there and take care of business, and yeah. um, it's crazy. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. Okay. I think that's enough about me. <laughs> I feel a little uncomfortable. You did good. You um, did good. I know that's not easy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, we got several questions about Zadarius Smith, obviously the big news of the week, the acquisition for a pass rusher who I think will really help the Lions Super Bowl chances without Aiden Hutchinson and, I don't know, pretty much every other pass rusher we yeah. heard of going into the season. Um, Corey, you've been around all week. Um, I guess what, was, what are your thoughts on Zadarius Smith and how he might help this team? I mean, the Lions were not pretty much – you look at the past couple of weeks since Aiden Hutchinson went down – They've been able to generate little to no pass rush at all. So I think being able to get a guy in there that is familiar with the NFC North, who at his best has been double digit sacks or right outside of that, I mean, it's better than what they've been able to have right now. So I think he'll be able to, by teams focusing on him, he'll be able to free up some of the other guys like Pascal to be able to go ahead and get to the, to the quarterback. So I believe it'll be a good addition. Remains to be seen how he, if, whether he suits up this week or not, and how he feels out with everybody else. But, you know, Pascal yesterday just said he thinks he'll be a great addition, a guy that he's looking to learn from. And just being able to have that veteran voice in the locker room, guys, a three time pro bowler, former all pro, just to be able to kind of coach some guys up. I think it'll be a good addition moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. And I do think the veteran aspect of that is smart too because like in recent weeks it's been levi playing outside and an undrafted rookie or not or el quadin muhammad off the practice squad excuse me and then before that it was like mikhail wingo a six-round rookie so like it was not only unproven depth it was young inexperienced depth so now you throw a zadaria smith you throw a josh pascal back in there this weekend that's what you need right there it's more power more inside out versatility guys that are going to be good against the run. That's, that's my favorite part about the Smith that yes, he's going to bring something against the pass rush, but this ain't going to be like just a pass rush guy. I think he was playing like 35% of the snaps against the run too. I mean, this is, this is like, he's like comparable to a healthy Marcus Davenport in a way, in the terms of the power he brings, the all around ability on the edge he brings. And the Lions are doing right by him by kind of giving him a couple days off because this was supposed to be his bye week. And that's, that's, that's tough in the NFL yeah. world. So we'll see how he comes out of that. Cause he has got a lot of miles on the wheels. So they're playing it smart. Yeah. William Anderson asked um, if Zedaria Smith was going to start on Sunday. Um, just to your point, Ben, um, I mean, maybe, but probably not. Even if he does start, he's mm -hmm. not going to play starter reps. I would imagine because this was supposed to be his bye week. And he's just played nine straight weeks of football for yeah. the Cleveland Browns, which sounds miserable. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, I think it's a great addition for, for Detroit. It was what they needed. I'm not saying anything, I think, novel, but um, they, they're they 3-0 without Aiden Hutchinson. Um, again, they're <laughs> killing folks. Um, taking away the football, they're, they're playing phenomenal offense, and even without Jamison Williams uh, on the field, and he should be back this week. Yeah. Um, but having said that, since Aiden Hutchinson went down, they have one sack from the defensive front. Yeah. And in Green Bay, none of the edge rushers, none of them hit Jordan Love. And that's simply not good enough. And it was good enough on Sunday, but this season is going to be measured by, are they playing in February? Mm -hmm. And um, to that point, they needed more of the pass rush. Yeah, it was uh, Aline McNeil from the inside to lead the team in pressure was seven. Guess how many the <laughs> defensive line and edge rushers had combined? Seven. They, they just needed more. They needed a body. Getting Pascal and Smith back at the right time. I know a lot of people wanted 16 trades to go down on deadline day for the Lions, but I really do believe that they did enough. <laughs> I, mean, they won, I think they won the trade deadline, if you're being honest. Of the available pass rushers that are out there, yeah. they got the best one. I mean, no, no people wanted Max Crosby or <laughs> Miles Garrett, but, I mean, you would have had to give up the farm yeah. if, they were, if they were available, and by all accounts, they weren't available. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. It, 
Exactly. And that's not Brad Holmes' MO. And that's the big reason why they're here in the first place. So I think they stepped, they, they stuck to their script while also helping themselves in the short term. I don't think they could have done any better, to be honest with you. Yeah. Rod, in, uh, Rod in Birmingham asks, no shade to the beat writers. Thanks, Rod. I'm sure this yeah. is going to be, I feel a butt. <laughs> Great <coming>. start. <laughs> <I feel a laughs> <butt. laughs> no shade to the beat writers, but why are they unable to report nuggets on a story like the signing of Zedarius Smith? Uh, I think he might trade yeah. for Zedarius Smith. Um, back in the day, Killer Kowalski, um, our legendary predecessor here at MLive, yeah. would get scoops like this. Now they come from people like ESPN's Adam Schefter. I've heard that these national reporters use their connections to agents. What structural changes in the industry led to this new information landscape? Um, you know, it, 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 people <laughs> listening right now can't see what Ben is doing. He's flashing the uh, eternal sign for money. Uh, and it's a, yeah, it's just it's a bigger business than it used to be. Um, you know, these agents, like an Adam Schefter, for example, now has the same agent as a lot of head coaches. Yeah. And of course, it, it helps the business to keep the news in house to help your guy. Uh, same with same with Ian Rappaport, like uh, Tom Pelissero, all these guys. I mean, they get fed the information from agents. And if you know what to look for on Twitter and how these guys report it. Mm -hmm. You can see them working the Asian game, uh, you know, giving credit for like, you know, to the, ex the actual agents who cut the deal or, oh, this deal is a hundred million when yeah. the deal is actually 50 million, but you can put fake money in the contract basically and inflate it and then get the initial news out there saying a hundred million when it's not, not anything like that. I mean, this is Schefter's terrible at this stuff and <laughs> shout out Adam Schefter. He's, he's, he breaks more news than anybody probably. It's mm -hmm. just, no necessarily shade at him. It's just how the business works now. And all these guys are reporting the fake numbers. That's why when the contracts come out two or three days later, it's always like, oh, it's like, <laughs> you know, half that or something. Um, and this isn't a Detroit thing. This is a, a, yeah. a, a league wide thing, a country wide thing. And it's not even just a football thing. It's all the sports. Like this is just how you don't see too much news being broken by local beat writers anymore, no matter how good they are. And I think Kowalski for a mate, he's just a legend for a reason. This press room that we're in right now, I'm looking at the sign as we speak yeah. is named after him. He's a, he's a legend. Um, uh, I don't think he'd break news now like he did back in the day. You know, it, it's just not how the business works. Um, they leak the stuff to their friendly and that's part of it too they, they, they go to the friendly yeah. source like adam Schefter's is not going to push back on a signing no like i remember Rappaport back in the day when he was reporting on jim bob cooter getting fired he said he was he called it a mutual a parting of ways <laughs> and that he was going to be one of the top <laughs> offensive coordinator uh, candidates in the league and we all know how that dumpster fire burned down the stretch and that's that's why they go to an a, a Rappaport because a Rappaport is not going to push back in a real way no it's it's ESPN and the NFL are in bed for billions of dollars in broadcast deals mm -hmm. together. And also it is the ride of, rise of the NFL network with guys like Tom and Ian. I mean, that is the league's broadcast network. So like there's, there are connections that we couldn't dream of making like on those levels. Like you said, I completely forgot Schefter's got like an NFL head coach agent and stuff like that. So yeah, it's just, you get the little things. I mean, every now and then the PR staff or your connections here will throw you a bone like I got with Josh Pascal a couple of weeks ago. But like, yeah, like that Zadarius Smith stuff is coming from the top of the ladder to the big dogs making the billions of dollars. <laughs> every time. <clears throat> every time. Um, <laughs> so David. Corey and I are coughing over yeah. here. <laughs> so David Qualls asks, obviously Brian Branch and Tribute Joseph have been two of the best safeties in the league this season, if not the best. Curious to get your thoughts on, on Melifonwu's role when he returns, maybe a rotation or strictly a depth piece. Thought he was pretty solid for the Lions on the stretch last year. Corey, what do you think on Iffy and what to expect from him? Uh, his, his clock just started this week. He should be playing here in a week or two. I mean, he was really good in coverage to, to me last year. Um, a big addition to the, to the defense. And I think with him out there, it's going to be another guy that's going to be able to hit hard mm -hmm. and um, – Make receivers think twice when they're coming over that coming over that middle and um, put some fear in the in the opposite of the quarterbacks. I mean, obviously Kirby Joseph and um, Brian Branch are two of the. As, I mean, Matt Lafleur said the other day they're two of the best safeties in the NFL. Mm -hmm. But he being able to get a guy back that was productive last season and being able you know fit into this group, give them more depth. I mean, the Lions have been peppered with injuries throughout the 
past couple of seasons and be able to get a guy back like that along with this unit that's rolling, it's only going to be a plus for him. Yeah, I am curious how to, what his role could or might be. I mean, he's got experience at the slot. He's got experience at corner. He's got experience at safety. And they do like to move Branch around some, so there could be a role there. I know they like what they've seen out of Brandon Joseph. And it's been weird with Melifonwu this year, like the injury in preseason – the no progress coming back, you know, every update from Campbell seems like a worse update than the one before, but like there in a world without Aiden Hutchinson, even with Zadaria Smith, even with the tools back, like they still are going to have to find ways to manufacture some pass rush. And that to me is Melifonwu's key strength. I mean, I know when he's on the field, the other team might be expecting a blitz, but like, man, that guy, I mean, he is a special blitzer. At least he was last season making some key plays on the pressure had some clutch interceptions, as you said, in coverage there. But, like, he's a blitzer to me. He's a run stopper. He's a blitzer. And I think he could be depth at slot. He could be depth at safety, too. He, he's pretty good in pass coverage. Uh, notably, he had the pick that sealed the division yeah, championship Minnesota. last year in Minnesota. His superpower is blitzing. Mm-hmm. Like, he, he's just phenomenal. He didn't. He told me last year during the playoff run that he blitzed one time in college. <laughs> awesome. Yes, it was a sack. <laughs> and he never blitzed when he came to um, Detroit uh, when he first got here. And that was something they toyed with him in the middle of last year. And before long, he was winning basically 90% mm-hmm. of his reps in practice. And that's what got him on the field. I mean, I think we were all surprised. I believe it was in Chicago when Tracy Walker yeah, wasn't in the starting yeah. lineup. It's like, wait a second, this captain is like not starting that's for right. Melifonwu who came out of like nowhere. Like we all, we all thought he might be like on his way out in Detroit last year. Yeah. And all of a sudden he's starting in Chicago and started the rest of the way. And it was because of this like this ability to blitz. And I, it's a particularly useful skill right now as the Lions try to grapple with the loss of Hutchinson and Kaminsky and all these guys. Davenport, I mean, they've lost a lot. And uh, Zendaria Smith will help. Getting a guy like uh, Melifon on the field, particularly for a guy like Aaron Glenn, who loves versatile yeah. chess pieces, loves to move him around, give a defense different looks. I mean, look at what Brian Branch and um, Kirby Joseph are already doing at yeah. safety. Interchangeable pieces. Uh, Kirby Joseph said that the pick that he had in green Bay was actually on a blitz that was for Brian branch. And that, that's how interchangeable it is. And so getting Malifanu out there will give it a different flavor. I wouldn't be surprised to see him in the slot. as like a big slot yeah. and obviously running downhill. The quarterback. Yeah. That's someone you feel comfortable covering a tight end. And I loved AG's comment on the blitz. He said, BB <laughs> thinks every blitz is for him. <laughs> <laughs> Why does, uh, so John, Bloomfield asks, why does Ben Johnson get all the credit for the Lions offense and Campbell is merely considered the culture guy or leader? I think it's Campbell's offense and he's far more involved in game planning and play calling than he gets credit for. I think John in uh, John Bloomfield actually makes a very, very good point. And I think it gets lost in all mm-hmm. the hoopla around Ben Johnson and where's he going to go and what are the Lions going to do without him? Like, yes, losing Ben Johnson will be a, that, that's going to be a massive uh, departure when it happens, mm-hmm. if it happens. Um, he's going to be the most valued guy in the head coaching carousel next, next off season. Um, but man, this offense has Dan Campbell's fingerprints all over it. Culturally speaking, philosophically speaking, all these fourth down calls, like just going for the throats. Like that's Dan Campbell, you know, like the running game, how diversified the schematics are, um, like preaching physicality, which I think is you talk to other teams that play the Lions, like that is that is the DNA of this team. That's what makes them special is how physical they are, and that obviously manifests in the in the running game. That's Dan Campbell, former blocking tight end. Yes. Like this is <laughs> this is what he's about. Yeah. Um, I think Ben Johnson's a phenomenal play caller. I think he really knows how to set up one play mm-hmm. with another. Like those are things the Lions will have to account for. But like. Dan Campbell made that hire. Yeah. Like Ben Johnson was a low ranking uh, <laughs> assistant when he came here. Um, and he kept like, he went up this, the, the staff real fast because mm-hmm. Ben Johnson saw it in them. They go back to their days in Miami. So I think that should give lions fans confidence that if, and when Ben Johnson leaves, um, that like Dan Campbell is going to make the right hire to, to have this offense in the right hands and his fingerprints will still be all over it. Yeah. That's exactly what we were trying to tell people when we kind of expected Ben Johnson to be gone last year or whatever earlier this year like 
the DNA, the blueprint to this offense was printed when Dan Campbell relieved Anthony Lynn of his play caller duties. and He took over calling those plays in that first year as head coach. Ben Johnson has taken that blueprint and morphed it into what it is now. But like it is, this is, this is Dan Campbell's scheme. This is Dan Campbell's DNA. That aggression comes from him. And I just think Ben Johnson, like you said, he's elite at sequential play calling. He's elite at knowing when to pull the trigger, what time to pull a play out. And he's been, and he deserves all the credit in the world for what he's doing with Jared Goff's career and resurrecting that and working with him there. But yeah, it's, that's, that's the one thing when I told people losing Ben Johnson would suck, but guess what? You still have Dan Campbell. That's the one thing I kind of want to piggyback on with the, with the Anthony Lynn. I believe Dan Campbell is, has a really good pulse of the team, whether it's for the players on the coach staff. And when he has to make a move, mm-hmm. the people that he's replaced them with have been just as good, if not better. I mean, yeah. go from Anthony Lynn, to Ben Johnson, you go from Deuce Staley to Scotty Montgomery. I mean, you made some changes with the uh, when he, when he had to relieve Aubrey Pleasant. They've always brought in guys that have came in and filled the role, and the team has grown from there. So as long as you have Dan Campbell, I mean, he's a good eye for talent, good eye for coaching talent yeah. as well. You got that guy, guy in place, everything's going to be all right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally agree, Corey. Um, the Lions might lose Ben Johnson. They could also lose Aaron Glenn. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Here um, we go again. <laughs> yeah, Kim, and this is coming into – this is a good question from Kim Mannis. Yeah. The Lions prepare to go to Houston where Aaron Glenn is from, uh, once played for the Texans too. Kim Mann asks, many people scoffed at the prospect of losing Aaron Glenn as a head coach candidate, but this year he has really proven what he can do when provided the horses he needs, what he has been able to, been able to do to make up for the numerous injuries to the D. Do you think it is likely we will lose Glenn after the season? Do, uh, does he have the luxury of staying with the Lions as Ben Johnson has done, or, or uh, are his plas- prospects more fleeting? Ben? Man, I've said it from the beginning. I love Ben Johnson. I think he's going to be a very good coach someday, but I think Aaron Glenn is the best head coach in waiting on this staff right here. I mm-hmm. think he embodies the culture creation. I think he has he is caught from Dan Campbell's loins, I feel like, a little bit, and knowing how to <laughs> create a culture and hire the right guys. And you talk about connections in this league. Aaron Glenn's got them all. I mean, this guy's from a Parcells, Belichick, whatever tree you want to talk about this guy's from. I, I really think that he's the type of guy that maybe he won't be the offensive play caller or anything like that or anything like that. But, like, this guy's going to be able to hire the right pieces. And I think he has the type of connection with players and his fellow coaches that, like, you can – Everybody wants to build a culture, but so many people fail at it. I think Aaron Glenn's best qualities are his culture building tendencies. And I, I really think that he's got a bright future. And you look at that opening in New Orleans and it's like, yeah, if you're not looking at Aaron Glenn for New Orleans, what are they doing? Because like, seriously, so you think if Aaron Glenn and Ben Johnson take over teams, you think Aaron Glenn, like your money would be on Aaron Glenn's teams to be better. I do. I do. I really, I really believe in Aaron Glenn as a top to bottom CEO of a franchise kind of in that head coach role. Well, there's two major prototypes, right? For head coaches, right there. You have the culture guys like a Dan Campbell, although I think he's more involved in schematics than people give him credit for. And then you have the scheme guys like a Kyle Shanahan or something like that. You know, Um, Ben Johnson will be the scheme guy. Mm -hmm. Aaron Glenn will be the culture guy, although we have a heavy hand in the defense. And so they'll go about the head coaching differently. Um, yeah, I've seen some stats bouncing around about how the offensive guys, the, the play callers, typically do better on on average. That's not to say the culture guys can't also do well. Dan Campbell is doing pretty damn well in, yeah. in Detroit. Um, but like the the I guess the historical trends in, in the recent years would favor Ben Johnson. I think Ben Johnson's a um, sicko. Yes, <laughs> I, I think he, he he is just a wizard when it comes to play calling. I do think I, do, I mean I agree with you, Ben. That I think Aaron Glenn will connect culturally, like he'll 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 connect in a bigger and better way than Ben Johnson will. I think Ben Johnson will actually rule with more of an iron fist than people think, mm-hmm. just based on how what I've heard about how how he controls his meeting rooms and his team and stuff. But you also can't argue with the results. And I think if I put my money on the two, it would be Ben Johnson. But Aaron Glenn's a pretty damn good coach, and I think people yeah. were asking the questioner is right. People were like like this guy was a head coaching candidate while the Lions had a terrible defense. Mm-hmm. And there's a reason for, reason for that. And that player poll came out in the back in the spring of this year. Yeah. And Aaron Glenn was the highest ranked coordinator among all players in the National Football League in terms of how much they liked the guy they played for. That speaks to how much he connects with his guys and how much they like playing for him. And 
value him and believe he makes them better. And these are like hallmarks of any good coach. So it'll be interesting. Yeah. My money would be on Ben Johnson, but I think Aaron Glenn is this year showing the world what the Lions already knew. Yeah. And I think he's a pretty great schematic defensive coach. And I think as long as he would make the right hires on offense, I think, man, you just, I wasn't even thinking about that player poll when I said that answer, but like, that's your instant recruiting pitch right there. And like, talk about a coach who's coached through adversity. I mean, you're going to face a lot of adversity taking over a new team as a head coach. And I think he is the type that's built for that. I think Ben Johnson's going to be great, but I look at Aaron Glenn and I'm like, that guy might be a very damn good head coach someday, like long term. I will say one thing that did impress me about Aaron Glenn is over these past three weeks with them not being able to generate the pass rush, he's somehow been able to galvanize that defense. And they've still been able to mm-hmm. not only get takeaways, but come up with big plays when they definitely needed to, to close out the game. So, I mean, yeah. kudos to him. I think that's going to go a long way. I would still say, I think Ben might be the guy just because of the way wonder how he would have did if he actually took that Washington job. Be quite honest. Right. Right. I know. It's, I know. it's another <laughs> reality. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, I, I, think, I, wonder, I think he probably won. Jaden Daniels. But um, I, I, think, I think Ben is going to be the guy. But Aaron Glenn, I mean, when he does get a team, just from talking to guys like Amik Robertson yesterday and just saying the way that Glenn coaches guys up, how he's got the whole locker room, that mm-hmm. whole defensive unit full of dogs, I think – Glenn might be a really good fit. That's I already closed my computer, so I think yeah. I think that's it. We got <laughs> we're way over to go to practice, but it was a good mailbag with some good football questions, and of course diving into what's happening transactionally on the the podcast. So you, you'll hear a lot more from Corey mm-hmm. going forward, Ben as well, of course. And I guess that's it for me. We'll miss you, man. Godspeed, man. It's been a it's heck been of an us. experience, man. One hundred ninety-one yeah. games to be exact. I counted them up. Um, I believe it was 89 wins, 100 even losses, and two ties. Two ties. They cushioned that win loss for you in the end. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> it's kind of, I guess it's kind of fitting that we're doing the podcast right here because when I, the first day when I oh, found yeah. I was coming to M Live, Kyle pulled me in this <laughs> room right here. And we I, had I completely forgot about that. Just two feet away. Two feet away. Little printer two, room. <laughs> pulled me in that room and had a chat and welcomed me to the team. What so year was that? That was oh, 22. Too. Okay, yeah, the start of the what we're seeing now, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and it's still going, and yeah, it's been fun to watch. And from Germany, late at nights, I'm sure I'll be watching too. Yeah, middle of the night, but it's been a ride. Thanks, everyone.